then um, we'll take a 15 minute discussion at the end. Um, can I kindly request all the presenters to stick strictly to the 20 minutes? I will give you a beeping sound or something, a five minute warning. Um, but yeah, um, I think let's just uh, limit the presentations to sort of the critical aspects and um, the things that are relevant to sort of the region in Africa and um, I guess um, the papers will be available to everybody after the sessions as well so um, more in-depth uh, examination of the papers can be done in there and I'm sure the presenters will uh, appreciate your comments there. Um, as I said uh, today's session is on um, inclusive industrial development um, so we have three presentations for you First by Dr. Pupiwa from the National Consumer Commission in South Africa on consumer protection. Then Dr. Oladeji on industrial policy and small business uh, development in Botswana. He is from the Institute for Economic Research of Africa based in Botswana. And then lastly, our presentation will be Dr. Nubong, who's with the Northwest University here in South Africa on economic transformation and regional industrialization. Um, to the participants, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, kindly please um, direct any questions you have in the Q&A, uh, maybe to help the presenters, just maybe um, state for which presenter the question is. I'll also try to keep track of um, which questions are directed to which uh, presenter, but um, we'll take it from there. <coughs> Dr. Bobio, I guess um, the floor is over to you. Um, much, Chair. Good morning to you um, all who are in attendance this morning. My presentation today will be focusing on um, discussions that we're already having about regional integration, about industrialization in the region. And because I come from a consumer protection perspective, I'm going to share with you some of the pros and or at least some of the aspects of the thinking in the region is. And then I'm also going to um, speak about also where the consumer protection aspect have to come in. I did title it Embedding Protection of Vulnerable Consumers in Regional Industrial Development Policies in, in SADC. But it, it, at the moment, it's a work in progress. So my first starting point was to just bring out some of the aspects related to um, consumers that we find uh, in the region and how broader policies that are emerging in the region um, will uh, actually uh, fit into this space. Also, what I've done in this, as you will see, is that I've also, or at least in, in my presentation this morning, is that um, I sent my, uh, my presentation yesterday thinking that at least it will be the final version of it. But later on, I sat down and I decided to sort of rethink some of the areas that I wanted to discuss um, during this period. Now, industrialization in Africa. It's something that comes off right from colonial, uh, the colonial era. I think industrialization was critical, especially for those countries that were settler colonies, the likes of South Africa, the likes of um, Rhodesia, which is present day Zimbabwe, and also Algeria with the French. These are countries that were meant to be areas of settlement for uh, the white settler population. And for them to be successful settler colonies, there was a need for industrialization to happen. And as I will um, just reflect on this, is that industrialization, it has always been a topical issue um, because of the benefits that, are yet, uh, that, that it brings to the fore for, um, for, for uh, the poor of the continent. But you must realize that there have been several models of industrialization over the years. Um, right from the colonial era, we saw how, for example, um, the apartheid South Africa government and the uh, uh, settler government in, in, in Rhodesia, southern Rhodesia at the time, how they used industrialization to break away from depending on basically the world when they were going through a period of sanctions. You will see that they introduced what was called import, substitu import substitution industrialization, which meant industrializing and that makes sure cut imports that are necessary for your economy to save on foreign currency. And you would expect that the post-colonial governments would take on this particular approach as well to make sure that they always substitute imports with local manufacturing so that they cut the dependency. But as you will see, or as I will just reflect on, 
industrialization is almost becoming elusive um, um, developmental meta in, because of the failure of most African countries to actually stick to the industrial plans that they put in place. I think, in, as I've said, in the 1960s, we have also seen regional efforts through uh, regional economic uh, communities. The beginning of the Antananarivo and the Monrovia um, um, discussions at the time in the 60s or in the late 50s, and the forefathers of probably African regional integration, your common groomers and them, you realize that they really visualize in Africa that, that almost did everything together, or in Africa that um, really participated in a very more, in an in a integrated manner. But of course, the approach of Muammar Gaddafi talked about of Africa and a whole lot of discussions around an Africa without borders. And whether these were physical or were social or economic borders, it is something that we are yet to establish is that most of the discussions often stall when it comes to um, putting them into place. I think what is uh, you know, uh, currently being taunted in, in, in regional integration discussions as a success story or a good beginning is the African continental free trade area, which uh, has been ratified now by quite a significant number of countries, which then makes it a very uh, important aspect. I'll speak to it a little bit. It is the one that I find to be a critical discussion point for my presentation this morning. I think, uh, as I will explain about it, it, is, it has got a producer-oriented focus on small and medium says the large private sector also lead um, in making sure that we have these amongst the member states. So it's about the sector being a partner or an important, significant part in development continent. And thus, it really is founded as a very important aspect. In the paper that I'm writing or that I'm still working on, I'm analyzing the ways in which regional industrial development policies and initiatives we'll have to embed consumer protection because this is how we ensure that um, consumers' rights are not violated and that consumers have access to safe goods and services. That is very critical because as long as you're in products into the markets and products that are deemed unsafe and it becomes very difficult therefore for consumers to really um, uh, benefit from them, then why should we have regional integration coming into place? Or why should we have regional industrial developmental policies if we cannot guarantee consumer safety and product safety uh, and any other aspects related to the rights of consumers? I, in this discussion, I also propose the implementation uh, the, the CTA trade area um, with the recent declaration on regional cooperation in competition and consumer policies by SADAC member countries. So I zone in into SADAC but then I do touch on sometimes where needed the rest of the country. Also, an emphasis on what I will call vulnerable consumers. And as you know, the African continent has got a large um, population of consumers. If you look at the whole continent as consumers, you're going to likely see a large percentage of those consumers being the impoverished ones, the poor communities that we find in all parts of the continent. These are consumers that will be vulnerable. I'll describe or I'll explain why I say that, or what characterizes vulnerable. Um, because they may be exposed to unfair practices by suppliers or locally manufactured products, considering that at present, the appetite to regionalize consumer protection has been limited. So I also critique the fact that regional protection is very limited. The other aspect, therefore, which binds this paper together is that we have an uneven African products and services market. By uneven, I mean that in some parts of the continent, we have pockets of excellence when it comes to producing products that are home or, or even if you look at locally produced, right? Or services that are proudly African. In, in, in. So it's uneven because in some cases you have excellence, in some cases you have really terrible products and products that can be dangerous, untested, um, products that don't have any guarantee in them, right? Now, you have that. And what you also have is that you also have South Africa being a critical player in the whole continent 
in offering goods and services. I will say that, that because you have South African owned companies that have been the continent. So you will have that proudly South African accessible in any part of the continent. At the same time, you might also have the downside of it where you have um, products from other parts of the world coming through South Africa and then the country of origin of those products ends up appearing to be South Africa when it's actually other countries that South Africa is sourcing from. In the end, of those goods can be questionable. At least the guarantee on such products can be questionable. For example, if your car breaks down when you imported it through Durban, what are you going to do in terms of tracing back the exact supplier who needs to give you recourse? Now, in 2000, you know, I always find this quote to be very meaningful in explaining the level to which um, the products that this part of the world to the rest of the continent. Thompson says you can watch it soapy opera Igoli car. And I think now the Riva and other African action um, content topies, you can watch that in Dakar. You can Peri Peri and Nandos in Maputo. And you can withdraw from a standard bank ATM in Harare, or you can buy serious juice from the Western Cape at ShopRite in Lusaka. And well, you can be wearing a DBS diamond from Botswana on your pinky finger. This is it shows you that in terms of you know, influence of products, uh, South African products are all over uh, the continent. Not always everywhere, but at least you can see the level to which local is investing in those countries, opening malls, opening shopping centers, and so on. Or you have um, um, uh, African migrants, um, con con countries, um, sending countries, also sending. To South Africa and migrate in form of goods and products and services that come, goods and products from South Africa. Now, if you look at border towns like Messina, those are shopping hotspots um, for South African products, but Asian products uh, Southeast Asian products coming through to Messina from Durban Port. Um, and you have second hand vehicles uh, from Japan um, coming through also that, uh, the, the same process in South Korea. And if you look at the truck war that we have currently in the country, it's been raging for years now. At the end of it all is that that truck war, whilst it spreads to other provinces, but ideally it's on the high level. And interestingly, that is a corridor that literally stretches from Durban to Lusaka or, or to Durban to any part of um, uh, East Africa. You, you, you trucks stretching out as far as um, uh, Congo. And that tells you that the connectivity is really large in terms of um, a corridor of goods and services. So that space becomes that space. Then, as I'm saying, I'm giving this illustration of South Africa having products that stretch out into the continent because of its um, um, levels of industrialization. But think of it this way. South Africa sneezes, the region also catches cold. Why do I say so? We have had in cases where products have to be recalled because of quality issues, because of product safety issues. In the previous year, we have had in 2018 and we have had to recall products from the shelves, right? And those products would have made their way to parts of Zimbabwe, parts of Lesotho, parts of Swaziland. The most of the region those products, recalling products that have gone as far as those places can be quite difficult. This year we had pilchards, um, uh, canned fish, and Botswana and Mozambique are the only ones that actually post uh, on certain products. And I think Zambia to an extent also issued a product recall notice um, with, regards to those, um, with regards to those particular products. And what we find is that the content those products that affecting a product recall can be quite a challenge. Now, because of the dominance that I'm talking about of the South African market or South African um, suppliers, 
What it then implies is that we need a cross consumer regime, a framework. The Consumer Protection Act that is applied in South Africa is very comprehensive, but it has no regional application. So this is the problem statement that I'm working with, that we have a dominance that we have, which whether it is positive or negative is not the discussion. The discussion is that because of that, it needs to be followed by a protective consumer uh, framework, which helps consumers to struggle in the region. Generally across the board, fundamentals of consumer rights apply. These are the UN guidelines on consumer protection you have rights to basic needs as consumers. You have rights to safety. You have rights to, you have rights to make selections. And again, with COVID-19, you realize that you have a right to choose products, but at the moment, because you're shopping online and you're making certain adjustments to your shopping uh, routine, your rights to choose doesn't always apply because sometimes your choices are being limited by the fact that supplies are not always in abundance. You have a right to representation. You have a right to redress as a consumer. You have a right to consumer education and you have the right to healthy environment. But then I talked about vulnerability and I just want to discuss a little about what vulnerability ent entails. The concept of vulnerability, it's something that has ev evolved. It would ideally mean in most cases, consumers who are poor, who can't read, who can't write, who are likely to be exploited by terms and conditions when they buy. But lately we have seen that vulnerability doesn't always stay on you at the same time. Also, we've also seen that sometimes you have temporary vulnerability. You are in a state of emotional drain, emotional issues. And as a consumer, you get a call to say, we are selling you this product. You just need to approve and say yes, and we will be able to send that product to you. As a consumer, you okay, might have- how many minutes? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So your vulnerability becomes increased simply because you as a consumer were able to sign up for a product without you really being in a good state of mind. When the product arrives, you say, I didn't order this. Then you realize now you have to pay for 24 months or 36 months for a product or a contract that you signed in under other circumstances where your vulnerability was. But in the continent, as well as in South Africa, we speak of historically disadvantaged people. They are vulnerable, yes. I mean, I mean or everybody else can be temporarily vulnerable. Maybe you're over indebted and you want more debt. But there are people who are historically disadvantaged. And we need to focus also our attention on them. Now, as African consumers, generally we have prevalence of consumer abuses, discriminatory and unfair market prices. In some cases, um, prices differ because of who you are, proliferation of low quality and unsafe products, we have lack of awareness of our rights, we have limited redress, we have inadequate protection for consumers, we have weak enforcement capacity. We can, we can inform our enforcement agencies where uh, poor quality products are being manufactured or bottled or packaged, but our enforcement might struggle or due to weaknesses might fail to actually go and attend to that. And then the, the African continent of free trade area that I've spoken about, I've already mentioned that it has got the potential to reach out to 1.2 billion potential customer, customers, and the private sector will be a major engine to make that happen. It also attaches to free movement of business and investments. But because of time, I want to quickly dash to the fact that benefits will accrue to consumers via greater product variety and lower prices and, and to domestic producers who may have access to competitive inputs and and services. So it will make it a bit easier for consumers to get what they need in terms of variety. But then it also means that African businesses, traders and consumers will no longer pay high tariffs on a large variety of goods that they trade in African countries. So that is, an, is a positive. But then if you look at it, e-commerce is the way to go because of COVID-19. And I wanted to say that one of the critical issues here is that the, the protocol itself, when it speaks to e-commerce, it talks about how we'll have customs duties. We'll have digital products, non-discrimination for electronic and digital products and cross-border flow. So that is very important. However, where it will be very critical is for consumer protection to be embedded and protection of personal information, obviously, being embedded into that 
and electronic supply of information, domestic electronic transaction frameworks need to be a part of this. So it's something that is very critical. And what I like is that uh, the Trade Law Center is tracing exactly what are some of those issues. Because as you see, you realize that the current uh, regime of the actor itself is very mum on consumer protection. Its protocol on trade and services recognizes consumer protection to a little extent, but it is only within that preamble. But what we need is more explanation which goes deeper. I'm going to um, simply wrap up and say that when we look at um, having these free trade area agreements and the regulations on consumer law and protection, what we also need to do is probably take a leaf on what we are seeing in the European Union, where consumer protection is part and parcel of the package that is provided in all um, trade in services and, and all protocols that are designed. You almost find it almost embedded inside that consumer protection becomes key in making sure that consumers in the end enjoy several rights, like the right to information, right to safety and protection, and the right to economic interest and, and the right to redress, which are very critical. So the UN guidelines also give this, and I think that we could also um, take a leaf from the EU guidelines as well in making sure that even in other areas like the Asian and the uh, Asia Pacific communities, we see them already beginning to have elements of consumer protection within their frameworks, but obviously to varying degrees. But the encouragement or the, 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 the conclusions that I draw is that we have the infrastructure, we have the scaffolding towards helping consumers to be part of these discussions when it comes to our regional economic um, interest and industrial development policies. I'll pause there, Chair, um, in the interest of time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, have this uh, conversation with you. Um, the, top, the title of my presentation is the promotion of Africa's economic transformation in this transition within a developmental regionalism framework. Now, I said myself, uh, the paper, the way it was structured, uh, initially was conceptualized to have a conversation that was pertaining to, um, to SADC, but uh, I, I, I constructed it initially as an, uh, I ended up writing it up as a, as a paper that is applicable for Africa. So my objective was to revisit the historical debates and explanations about Africa's industrialization uh, in the light of new case study experiences of industrialization in the last 50 years. And uh, the key message I wanted to get from that is that the whole notion of competitive advantage that we typically pull out of uh, trade um, uh, literature is not static, it, it can be created. The second objective of the paper was to look at what opportunities are available for Africa's economic transformation and industrialization, given the, the changing patterns of global trade. Um, and the key message that I want to present out of that is that I am of the view that Africa should revisit um, its stance on resource-based industrialization. And uh, the final uh, objective of the paper is to try and revisit uh, objective one and two within the light of, uh, of a regionalization framework. Can regional integration make a difference? And in that, I try to make the case that we should be pushing for the adoption of um, what I've called, or what the literature has called, a developmental regionalism uh, framework. So, just to give you in terms of background, I hope I can speak, uh, bring up those uh, those three key messages. Um, we know from the past that, uh, uh, and, and within the growth and development literature, that industrialization tends to play a very key uh, role in the development and upliftment of, of, of the privileged uh, countries. So, not for, but, um, because for obvious reasons, it contributes to productivity gains, uh, it contributes to job creation for skill level, uh, underlying the productivity benefits is the it causes the raise the, the, the trading sector, the industrialized or the manufacturing sector to increase its tradability in international markets, which uh, at the same time reinforces uh, scale economies and uh, technology digestion. These are all the standard uh, arguments as to why industrialization, particularly from a manufacturing perspective, is often presented as being advantageous for countries' development. Uh, by the strengthening of domestic, uh, uh, by the access that it has to international market and the increased access to competition, it provides incentives for the strengthening and the innovation capacity of the, of the domestic production. So this is why, uh, and, and, and because of these stated advantages of industrialization, uh, it is often always desirable that a country that can pursue this 
should actually uh, go down that road. But there are new realities that are emerging with the nature of global industry at the current moment that places Africa on a, a difficult space uh, because it is still in the process of trying to go through the previous cycles of industrialization while we are talking about industry 4.0. So um, in the past, the challenges, obviously, uh, which is well established from an African perspective, was that post-independence uh, African countries um, believed in a state-led infrastructure industrialization uh, model. And uh, as, as the data showed, shortly after independence and in the few years that followed, uh, manufacturing actually did grow immediately post-independence. And of course, this was shaped by state-led protectionist uh, policies. But after a series of external shocks, including the oil prices, the variability in terms of commodity prices, interest rate rises, uh, the, the lack of resources in, your, in, in African public coffers, given that this was a stateless process and often indexed a structure adjustment project, uh, uh, structure adjustment program, uh, the limitation of the domestic market, and all the related factors, Africa has witnessed a decline in industrialization, which is the problem that brings uh, us in the forum like this. Now, the consequence of this is that it's often touted that Africa has had a first uh, failed period of industrialization uh, that has reduced most African countries to the exporters of unprocessed natural resources with little value addition. Now, this is the core question that uh, we are seeking to, to change. The whole notion that Africa has been left occupying inferior positions in global value chains of products which they produce now. Despite their manufacturing uh, potential, there are very few uh, uh, factories in the, in, on the continent. All of this is explained against the background of established structural weaknesses, um, such as your poor infrastructure, weak logistics, the trade frustration issues that the previous uh, speaker was making reference to, like the absence of accreditation networks. Now, I'm of the view that I think that the problem of Africa's industrialization is well known, well documented, well established. Why were the previous episodes not successful? That is clear. The question which we are asking ourselves, in my opinion, from where we find ourselves are the following. How do we change this? Uh, looking at where we are at the moment and where we desire to be on the one hand, what opportunities are there in terms of the current structures of global production that uh, uh, can reverse that? Now, I think that we have a problem of production capacity both from the accumulation of available knowledge and technology intensity. I feel that the whole question of global value chains has to do with the politics of market access. Africa needs to be able to negotiate better but it's much more beyond the politics of market uh, market access. Um, uh, it's something that needs to be resolved. I feel that questions of competitive and competitive advantages from the resource and development perspe uh, perspective don't need to be started. They can be changed. And of course, it will be key to address the structural weaknesses that limit industrialization. So you can see the consequences of that in declining manufacturing as a percentage of GDP, especially uh, in the last couple of decades. And so I wanted, I want to ask, uh, uh, in the paper, I wanted to then ask myself the question, what opportunities are there in the current patterns of global trade, uh, trade and what lessons should Africa learn from the newly industrialized uh, Asian economies uh, in the last 50 years? In terms of opportunities of the current patterns of global trade, we are going to realize that the fastest growing exports in the world are still non-resource-based manufacturers. But however, there's the emergence of global supply chains of manufacturing and services as a result of the unbundling of production and the growing trade intermediate goods. This point one and point two and point three, the growing fragmentation of production has important policy implications for, for African countries uh, from the perspective of it imposes upon them the, 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 the responsibility to develop the capacity to plug into existing patterns. Now, the unbundling of production and the expansion of trade in intermediate goods and the growing role of services uh, in, in, in global trade and associated manufacturing suggests that contrary to the 60s and the 50s when the full, uh, production was, or manufacturing was the full 10 kills still from, from the from cradle to the grave, Africa can develop, or African countries can have, do have the opportunity to develop capacity to plug into certain segments of the production cycle and to plug into certain segments of the global supply chain which uh, does then reduces the, 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 the what, is, what you call the burden of having to accumulate the technological know-how and requisite skills to spread the production participation onto the full cycle. We're going to see that a lot of this is happening uh, in a lot of Asian countries that develop capacity to produce, for example, computer chips, um, as opposed to participating in the production of extensive uh, 
uh, uh, the whole uh, product as, as it were. So uh, this, these are opportunities that can be can be plugged into. It also highlights it needs for that for, for Africa to have plug into those opportunities, it needs to have targeted investment in skills, targeted investment in the productive capacity of those identified areas, and of course uh, creating the requisite uh, infrastructure and targeted investment in increasing domestic value addition. It, this will have to be through uh, the, how the development of strategic industrial policy uh, to be able to identify the areas in which the continent can take advantage of um, those opportunities that are presented by current global patterns of production. We're going to see that. So that, that's the first thing that uh, message I wanted to bring across. The second message I want to bring across is this whole pattern of change in national exporting uh, manufacturing that has happened over the last uh, couple of decades. We're going to see that manufacturing has shifted you know, from, from, the, from the northern hemisphere uh, to a certain extent to the east. Now, the countries that in the last couple of years have increased their share of export manufacturing at the global scale include countries like Philippines, Mexico, China, Malaysia, Thailand, and Sri Lanka. Why is this important for Africa? It's important for Africa because uh, these were countries which 50, 60 years ago were exactly in the same classification strand as most African countries. And we must ask ourselves the question, what did they do differently? And they are picked up on the number of things that uh, are covered of that. Number one, they have narrowed down the income gap with richer countries based on the establishment of leading industrial sectors. It speaks to the role of industrial uh, strategic industrial policy. Number two, have been able to develop related technological and social capabilities that are promoted already through a series of linkages and diversification into new sectors. Have been able to combine a strong rise in their share of manufacturing, uh, output and employment with a strong labor productivity growth. And the rapid pace of investment helps to tap both learning and scale economies that sustains their productivity growth. And it is important to realize that um, in this right, the rise of, ex of, of, of exports uh, can be explained through a careful nesting of an investment uh, export uh, nexus that was key to the expansion. To look at how that played out in terms of the shift in manufacturing on the global scale, they're going to realize that of all the various regions of the world, Africa, of course, um, over a period of between 1980 and 2000, experienced a decline. North America experienced a slight increase, but um, Asia and, and, and Oceania were the ones that almost doubled their export potential, uh, export capabilities in, in within that period, uh, while Western Europe experienced a slight decline. Now, why is this graph important? And why is this important for the African narrative? Um, it's important for the African narrative, simply from the perspective to say that, like I said earlier, and number one, these countries that have experienced this increase in manufacturing were the same countries which uh, 40, 50 years ago were described as not having the comparative nor the competitive advantage to participate in manufacturing in this manner. But they have been able to turn that around, which tells African and African industrialization that comparative and competitive advantage is not a static, uh, you know, your classical uh, Ricardo model of you produce agricultural products and I produce the kind of, uh, mechanical products because I have a competitive advantage. That is something which unfortunately we teach in our uh, economics and trade lectures, but practitioners in the field and the experience of other regions should get us to realize that competitive and competitive advantage are not static phenomena. They can be changed with the right combination of policies and the right uh, uh, activity, in this case, strategic industrial policy. So the key questions that Africa needs to ask itself is to try and draw the lessons that um, what, where to from here from an African perspective. Uh, where, where must Africa go in terms of its pursuit of industrialization? The lessons of Asia tell us that it is possible if you put together a combination of right policies. And so for me to answer this question, there were two key solutions that, uh, two key proposals that I re-examined. Number one, I wanted to re-examine the role of um, what do you call it? I wanted to examine the role of uh, um, I wanted to examine the role of your manufacturing led uh, uh, of your resource based industrialization. That was the one thing I wanted to, 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 to examine. And secondly, I wanted to examine the role of, of, uh, of what role the region has. So, as far as your manufacturing based industrialization, as to answering the question of what should be the way forward for Africa, now, this, the historical experience many resource-rich countries show that commodity sectors, contrary to the resource-scarce argument, can actually foster productivity growth. 
technological uh, innovation through the establishment of forward and backward thinking. Now, this is provided. Now, this is provided and uh, supported by both institutions and investment in human capital knowledge. Uh, in the case of Sweden and Finland, the development of sophisticated processing industries was mainly the result of investment in skills and research from public and private institutions. Um, successful backward linkage industries develop a specialized machinery, engineering products, transport services, and equipment. I want to pause on this slide to essentially make the argument at, uh, according to which, if you look at the, the development of Norway, the question from an African perspective uh, is not that it is starting from natural resource base. The question is what it chooses to do with that natural resource base. And there are examples that abound across the world of countries that previously were resource intense and are what we call your new resource rich countries. That the difference comes in at the level of the creation of the right institutions and a targeted, deliberate investment in human capital and knowledge. South Africa's industry, let me just get into South African context. South Africa's industrialization potential, for example, is limited by its human capital. South Africa has a huge industrialization potential. It's sitting on a continent of one billion people, but it does not have the production capacity to take advantage of the African market. Targeted in, uh, investment in uh, development of institutions and investment in human capital and knowledge should say that, like India, uh, constructed policies to deliberately ship your call centers from the US to India as a targeted policy to deliberately become an IT, uh, ICT hub of the world. South Africa is supposed to become a, a, an industrialization hub. This is not going to happen by the slow, targeted, let's address domestic issues approach to industrial policy. It needs to, with a population of 50 million people, essentially transfer technology and engineer. But that's a conversation for another day. Foster resource based solution in Africa would happen by the development of backward and forward linkages in the commodity sector. And countries can examine and can proceed to this to maximize direct and indirect employment. Option and downstream manufacturing, the services sectors are going to benefit because they will offer market opportunities for small and large size businesses that are mostly absorb your skill at your semi skill level. Uh, Soft commodity sectors, resource processing, can simulate raw material supply which creates further employment across sector. Africa can promote the discussion of technology capabilities uh, of their skill base by developing backward linkages supply firms to the community sectors and resource processing industry. The message in all of this from uh, the proposal is the potential is huge, the possibility is there. Policy, strategic industrial policy is going to make the difference. Which brings me now to my uh, 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 last question. Uh, what then becomes the role in terms of your economic transformation and industrialization from, uh, a region, from a regional perspective? What role can, what, what should regional integration or regional cooperation or regionalization at the sub-regional and at the continental level look like in order to address this problem? Now, I Five can minutes. make a proposal. Say it again. Five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. So that, that's my final, final point. I hope I can be able to wrap that up in five minutes. So I, I then make a, a proposal that says that uh, industrialization and, and uh, um, the region and regional integration can play a role in economic transformation and industrialization if it adopts what Davies and others have called a developmental regionalism paradigm. Now, developmental regionalization argues that argues for the adoption of development integration approach that has both micro and macro coordination in a multi-sectoral program that embraces production, infrastructure, and trade. It seeks to promote an equitable balance between the benefits of regional integration and complementing efforts towards trade integration by those that focus on regional industrial development. Now, the UN defines it as a cooperation among countries in a broader range of areas. That should include investment, research, and development, as well as policies aimed at accelerating regional industrial development and regional infrastructure provision such as building up of a better network of roads and railways. Let me pause on this and just make the argument uh, in a short and simple and crisp manner. The trust of African regionalism and integration has been market integration, the creation of a continental free trade area, uh, for building upon the Abuja Treaty, the creation of an African economic community. The whole notion of argument that says our point of departure is that we are small economies, and small if we stand on our own, let us integrate, create larger markets, and then we should be able to take the benefit of a larger market to be able to industrialize. Of course, this in practice has proven to be a complicated process, but it has come with the added inconvenience of shifting all of our 
uh, regionalism efforts and investment in trying to make market integration happen. Forgetting that there are other elements that are also critical in fostering, uh, a, a, in pursuing a collective de uh, developmental agenda from a regional perspective, because that is what Africa has been trying to do. The one Kumas and Fanti Panda says, let us cooperate, we're going to perish. And cooperation has meant, let us find ways of developing together. And why not industrialize together? But an emphasis on market integration just sets up a target that we seek to accomplish, which target in itself has lots of weaknesses. Whereas we could emphasize on the creation of strong architecture and investment in capacity to drive regional integration as an objective, not as a by the way. You know, it would entail clear articulation of objective, essence, nation, direction, um, a, a, the whole pursuit of uh, integration from a different perspective that supersedes uh, ex an exclusive focus on, the, on, on market in the solution. Now, there are four policy tools, drivers that can foster developmental regionalism in Africa, industrial policy. The focus, so here's the point I'm trying to make. If there was an equal focus on, industrial, on, on regional industrial policy as there was on trade integration, the approach that would have been adopted to regionalism would have been different. Um, and the, the, the objective to just simple merge markets together would not have been the driving force and essence of African integration. We would have been looking at other things like the development and implementation of these regional industrial policies. We would have been looking at other things like the development and use of uh, uh, development corridors. We would have been looking at uh, the establishment of special economic zones that runs, run across regions. You know, think of think of a special economic zone that runs across outside the Eastern, uh, uh, East African community right up to North Africa, or that runs from Cape to Cairo. So that runs from uh, from Senegal all the way down to Tanzania, a special economic zone that says that in so doing we are trying to stretch production and uh, uh, manufacturing to run across that whole corridor with the requisite infrastructure, the special institutions that go with that, and so on and so forth. This is going to then help in the promotion of industrial value chain. So, in conclusion, the argument I'm making is that an equal amount of energy needs to be invested in promoting cooperation on the development of cross-border infrastructure and investment in the same uh, trade facilitation measures that will yield greater developmental uh, benefits. That's my first conclusion, number one. Number two, this would practically entail the, would mean that African regionalism needs to change its model and get other sectors involved. For the simple reason that it is actually trade, businesses, uh, foreign companies that actually drive the whole process of the integration of sectors. So there should be more private sector involvement, more civil society involvement, uh, civil society involvement and a, a greater involvement of the national constituency. They should not just be talked about at the table. They should be sitting around the table and driving process. Practically speaking, it should be South African firms driving the agenda of what it takes to expand into the rest of Africa. Obviously, we know that for all intents and purposes, government needs to lead and drive the process. But a change in focus and a change in, 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 in uh, uh, direction means that Africa needs to completely examine its focus on market integration in favor of the pursuit of what we have called uh, developmental uh, region, regionalism. This reduces the question of industrialization not to be a question of whether Africa can industrialize, uh, ignoring its commodities, but rather how it can make use of this uh, commodities to promote linkage development, value addition, tap into the opportunities presented by the service industries and develop its, uh, its technological uh, capabilities. Now, this is going to require complementary policies and local content um, and policies that emphasize on, on, on local value addition. I think that with that, uh, permit me to stop on that. i uh, summarizing that essentially, the problems of industrialization in Africa, they are known. Uh, it, it's not just a question of, um, it, they are known. Uh, it's a question of production capacity, both from the accumulation of knowledge and skills and technology. It's a question of the politics of market access, uh, what it takes to uh, gain access to global value change. Comparative advantages in natural resources and competitive advantages cannot be static. They need to be created. Africa needs to create, identify, and create uh, competitive advantages in specific industrial sectors, given the opportunities that are available in the current uh, uh, nature of global production. And that is now the role of the original industrial policy. I thank you, and let me stop at that. Um, good presentations. Um, all right, the the team is trying to just connect with Dr. Oladeji again, um, but um, let us continue um, while we're waiting.
Um, Dr. Popio, I think you made a very good presentation as well, um, just highlighting the issues around consumer protection. Um, sort of two of the questions that I noted for you specifically were around the role, what will the role of ISO be? I guess it's in the context of this whole international collaboration and the point you made about there not being sort of a regional um, mechanism to, 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 to deal with this. I think the second question was sort of related in that it asked, what is the actual status quo for the SADC region? What happens right now when there are problems with products in other markets and regions and how do we deal with that? And um, I just picked it up. So um, I guess uh, tied to the question on the static status quo is what actually then is happening with regards to the free trade area? Um, is it only now the rules being set for e-commerce? And I guess my final question would be around what are then the practical things that must happen to sort of set these things in motion? Dr. Popua, Netson? Questions, could, could you repeat the first one? What is the role of what? It was around uh, international standards uh, organizations and accreditation. So ISO, I guess uh, the context is around the multilateral consumer protection environment and how that relates to then what we want to do as Africa. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, so the standard space is very interesting because it's uh, standards um, associations or standard regulatory bodies help us to have um, or at least to protect consumers from those same issues I was talking about, consumer safety and so on. Um, but then we have two types. We have voluntary ones, like what we have in South Africa, this, the Bureau of Standards. Um, those standards are voluntary. Um, suppliers or manufacturers actually uh, buy into these standards to prove that their product has been quality tested or have gone through the standards that exist. We have compulsory ones. That's why we have the compulsory regulatory uh, uh, the national uh, uh, regulator for compulsory uh, specifications, uh, NRCS, which is our sister entity. However, those ones, that's the reason why we had a recall of pilchard tinned foods because, uh, tinned fish, because um, they are compulsory. They ensure that, um, you know, manufacturers have to comply. Now, in terms of international organizations, you have, itself and we have inside ISO what is called COPOCO which is the uh, is the is the policy on, on, on consumer standards right um, I'm just forgetting what the acronym stands for but COPOCO comes in again as recommending standards related to um, consumer oriented protection consumer protection and customer focused um, kind of um, um, standards so maybe how to handle customers and so on complaints handling and the like so there is that role already being played by those uh, isos and and at national level each country then does that for example um uh, in zimbabwe is the standards bureau if you go to zambia you also have um for example our the, one of the entities there will be the consumer uh, law and consumer uh, protection um competition and consumer law sorry so you have that as a commission that is responsible for that so it's at a national level, but here's the critical aspect. If a product is not originating from South Africa, and it's not originating from Zambia, it's not originating from Malawi, but it's originating from South Korea, the application of local laws there also differs depending on who the supplier of that product is. So it's a bit of the consumer law that then kicks in at national level. So what we are advocating for is that can we not at least still make it possible for products to be regulated as they leave certain market areas in order for consumers to still get the benefits? Or better still, if you purchase a Toyota in South Africa, can your warranty continue to work or your motor plan continue to work as you cross borders and leave in other parts of the continent? Those are some of the kinds of aspects that we're tr trying to address through that. In some cases it works, in some cases it is left to suppliers giving um, their own warranties and guarantees. And we are saying what about a regional approach to that? And that will be applied 
um, across the different uh, con uh, countries, and their capacity to enforce also becomes a challenge. The other question is, what is the status quo of dealing with complaints in South Africa? And I think I've already started to uh, respond to that, to say there are certain areas where suppliers have regional influence, or at least they uh, cut across. For example, ShopRite um, and Checkers will have branches across certain parts of the continent. It means that in the region, uh, you should be able to get recourse from them because they are using the standards that they have already been using in their their country of origin, in this case, South Africa. But products that leave South Africa and go to other parts of the, of, of, of the region, then it can become a challenge in terms of them uh, enforcing quality and, and those kinds of aspects. The same also for goods that come from outside of, 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 of South Africa, from Zambia, Copa, and so on. The whole issue of enforcing uh, standards then becomes, or at least compliance with quality, can then become challenging. So my response to that will also be that there is already a protocol that we have been signatories to. I think almost all the SADA countries have signed to it, which is a protocol. Again, it's more to talk about cooperation in enforcing uh, consumer law, uh, laws, but it does not yet speak from a, let's say, a legalistic uh, approach that you can be prosecuted for violating these um, uh, rules as you cross the board. I hope I kept it all your, your questions, uh, Che. Um, are you still with us? Um, how do we find the balance between consumer protection and local manufacturing growth or regional integration? Um, right, I think, I, I think um, this question from Lisa, um, my approach here will be that South Africa does this slightly better than the rest of the other con uh, countries in the region in that they are, especially, for example, the motor vehicle section, where motor vehicle sector, where you cannot import cheaper, cheap imports and register them in the country. So protectionism becomes, protectionist uh, legislation becomes the way to go, or high tariffs for products that you would have to do that. But secondly also is the issue of in, in, ensuring that imports are also um, sub, uh, subjected to um, uh, what do you call it, are also subjected to um, quality tests that we have with our own local um, standards bodies in the, in the different countries. However, I must hasten to say that I agree with you that um, the Chinese malls that you're talking about, the illegal imports and customs fraud, begin to be the things that weigh heavily on us. So <clears throat> when you talk about inferior products that have been smuggled, then it means we need to increase enforcement uh, in areas where we find um, we, where we find breach of law in terms of uh, product safety and product quality. However, I think that it's really about tightening uh, quality control in the area. Of, it's about tightening quality control if you have standards bodies. It's about also um, ensuring that your enforcement and your investigating capacities are enhanced in order to, 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 to really tackle this. For example, just speaking lastly on our experience as a commission, we, we actually go to the ports to monitor, uh, especially the textiles. And I must say that it's never easy because some consignments will come when we are not present at the ports. And then we are unable to check those because the most important thing for South Africa, country of origin must be labeled on those textiles. So the issue of cheapness has to do with enforcement being tighter. How can consumers be better protected during COVID-19. Um, what's currently, uh, if, if you can allow me to speak from our side of the story as a commission responsible for consumers and also our sister entity, the Competition Commission, is that we actually have had to do new regulations for products, um, uh, especially related to pricing. We've been targeting price gouging because that's where the most likely thing is to happen is that when you have a crisis like COVID, most suppliers are likely to hike or spike prices unfairly. And so we have set up um, toll free numbers where consumers can phone in report uh, purported price gouging. Then we go into investigation and where we find them guilty, we prosecute them through the consumer tribunal or through the competition tribunal. So this is sort of the ways that we are doing it. Unfortunately, our awareness programs have always been going to the streets to talk to consumers. 
and in this case it means we are going virtual and which is not always as effective because the most vulnerable are not also found in virtual spaces thank you uh, apologies uh, my bandwidth just kicked me out there for a second but i'm back now um, I hope you've uh, all captured um, the responses there. Uh, Gabila, uh, my chat and Q&A function has been uh, deleted, but I have noted um, two distinct questions around um, how, how to link um, the skills issue that you raised around targeted skills intervention. and how do you actually get that going practically? And um, I think one of the key points that linkages, um, I think from a reason is it, it, it's quite a lot of multinational companies. And as you rightly say, the local content issues then become quite eminent, but we have been struggling quite a bit with that. So uh, practically, how then do we get, uh, start developing some of those linkages? Uh, Baba, if you maybe have a record of the previous questions, maybe you can just relay them back to Gabila as well. Hi, I'm Buffy. Thank you. I think we can tackle that question. It covers one question on the on the Q and A. I didn't quite get it. This development that is led by industry and skills development that is led by education departments. Um, so the question was: business intervention and skills development is usually short term and specific industry focused. So then, how can we use policy to close this gap? Yes, we do have a res we do have resources, um, but I think the question was relaying back to what you were talking about uh, in your presentation around the uh, the skills or the education system broadly. I think it's 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 on the one hand, broadly speaking, looking from an outsider's perspective, a question of policy coordination. Uh, um, for whatever reason, the various the two different entities that are, are given the charge and the responsibility of dealing with this, uh, both from an industry and from a department educational perspective, have the responsibility therefore to compare notes and see that what they are each doing is feeding into each other. So, so evolving from the current status quo to where we want to be would be a policy coordination issue. But, but in terms of looking at it from a long-term uh, policy evolution plan. I would argue that it, it would it would it would take a policy policy co coordination and coherence. It's a managerial issue, uh, but when it comes to the identification of priorities, uh, uh, that that also go with the resource allocation. I think it goes much more to a vision issue uh, and a long term planning issue. Uh, uh, managers cannot be leaders. Managers implement the two entities you have called. Uh, leadership that essentially looks long-term and decides that South Africa is supposed to become a knowledge island is going to come from a policy conference. Uh, it will affect resource allocation. It, it, before, before the policy conference, it needs to even become a national conversation. Uh, because at the moment, we are caught up with, with some very suboptimal uh, basic conversations around uh, availability of resources, where is the money going to come from? Uh, there's not a, a broad-based consensus that this should become a national priority and the objective of, of targeted uh, deliberate investment without wanting to downplay the efforts and the, the very hard work of all those who are involved in the, in, the, in, the, in the process. I take a leaf out of the debate we're having on fee pay education at the, at the higher educational level. And uh, of course, there are very well-founded meritorious argument in, on all sides but the fact of the matter remains that if you look at our, our, our fall, fall uh, throughput rate, you know, for the sake of the argument, for every 100 student that goes to grade one um, and follows their batch up to the point where they complete uh, with a degree at the university, the fall through rate is extremely high. A lot of people fall through the cracks. In a context where we are already on the scale, now this is going to go. It, uh, this is going to go to, uh, and there are lots of explanations for that. There's a lot of explanations for that. But if, if for the sake of the argument, you have for every 100 students that start in, in, in grade one, 20 that graduate with a degree. Let us forget about the quality of the degree. Um, if we have that kind of an argument and see that the 20 graduate with their degree 
when they have had a certain percentage of their colleagues excluded because of the or financial exposure at the level of the university, when they have had a certain percentage of their colleagues that fell through the cracks because they could not make it up to the past metric. We're sitting with a crisis that's a ticking time bomb. It's going to require something much more than the level of engagement that we're having on this issue uh, to be able to reverse it, especially if South Africa intends to become the manufacturing or the industrialization engine of the continent. There's no doubt it has taken, it is significantly more advanced and more industrialized than most African countries, but it is just a one eyed man in the land of the blind. If the country has to jack up the production of engineers, it is deliberate investment in that area. If it has to jack up the, 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 the qualities and the, of specific skills, I guess, maybe let me just say summarily, we need to do more than we're doing at the moment. And, and, and when I talk about that more, I, 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 I place it at the level of the vision of the leaders of the country, not at the level of the coordination of the people who are implementing the existing plans. I think the plans need to change. And for the plans to change, we need to see it as a national priority and then start undertaking uh, practices that all the other advanced economies are currently practicing. You know, there is not a single advanced economy in the world. Canada, the US, uh, Germany, UK, Netherlands, they have very active policies to import skills. These are already highly skilled uh, economies, but they have very active policies, very, very, very intentional policies to attract skills from all over the world and add to the economy. The national conversation of South Africa on immigration issues is people are, are frustrated that Nigerian engineers are going to come and take their, their, their shops by the side of the road. It is, it is just, a, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I liken that to a vision question. You know, when America is trying to uh, absorb skills from the rest of the world, they're taking IT technicians, doctors, everything in the, in the, in the COVID pandemic area, the American government came out and says, if you're a medical doctor anywhere in the world, please come to our country. Uh, so attracting of specific reasons that have been the function of clearly articulated policies and priorities that would fit into South Africa's industrial policy and its vision for the continent needs to be part and parcel of the leadership conversation. And the leadership needs to drive the agenda of changing the narrative at the level of the common South African person. So that they begin to see the attraction and retention of specific skills as value adding for where South Africa wants to go to. So that we can then stop this conversation about um, this kind of, uh, uh, I don't want to call it xenophobia for lack, for lack of being misunderstood, but this, this sentiment that fails to see uh, that we need to do what all other advanced economies do to advance. So I, I, I don't know if I answered the question, but those are my views on the issue. Thanks. The question is to Kabila, Kabila uh, because I also work in the same space. Uh, you are talking about uh, uh, um, industrial policy uh, that can, that can uh, foster regionalism, uh, regional, um, what you call regional uh, industrial policy. I don't know what the term. But given the history, we have two histories of industrial policy. One, way it works, we have the East Asian economies that used it a lot. And then we have some kind of industrial policy that were in Africa under uh, ISI, um, the, the ISI era. Uh, so what would you recommend? How would you view the form of industrial policy that would create the, the, the value chain, the, the, the backward linkages that you are talking about? In the, You're breaking, in, I'm struggling to hear you. Sorry, how would you view the type of industrial policy that would be appropriate for the context of, of, of Africa so that we can develop it the back of um, using the backward linkages into and out of the primary commodity sector. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I, if I understood you correctly, uh, Vuyo. Uh, let, let me preface my remarks by saying that, you know what, from a policy formulation perspective, South Africa as a, as a country can hardly be faulted. I don't think that there's a specific weakness with South Africa's industrial policy. The diagnoses are appropriate, the interventions are, uh, are clearly designed, um, and, 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 and the rollout and implementation up to this point, subject to current existing capacity issues, is the reality we have. I think the problem lies at the level of the practice of, of regionalism at the, uh, at the level of SADC and at the level of the African continent. Um, 
uh, the model of regionalism that we are practicing, unfortunately, does not accurately make it realistic for us to have either regional wide planning or continent wide planning. Uh, the model of regionalism that we're currently practicing is we have an old boys club, you know, a group of people that uh, come and meet together every often, talk about important things identify areas that they think that they could be cooperating on and uh, and then and then go back home and sign a few documents and then wait for the next meeting and 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 of the 100% of the discussions that they have about 5 to 10% actually gets translated to implementable work at the level of the of the of the players like yourself in the field that actually gets to work that there is no african constituency that demands uh, an African level planning in terms of policy. There are national constituencies that place pressure on their national leadership. And national leadership responds from a resource allocation perspective to those national priorities. And references to regional integration and cooperation, even for the creation of an industrial policy perspective, becomes mere rhetoric. Mere rhetoric for the simple fact that there is no constituency. The absence of constituency means that there's no enforceability and there's no accountability. There's nobody who's going to go toy toy there, you know, on the static wide scale because the presidents have not done something that they promised to do. So, so, so regionalism and regional integration, then from the continent of a sub regional perspective, it serves at the pleasure of the evolution of the political principles. And that has to change. And uh, without us being able to address those broader questions of how we regionalize, the formulation of, of regional industrial policy is going to suffer from a lot of limitations. A lot of limitations because you can only implement policy from the perspective of a shared resource base. Either a common resource base, um, a, a common resource base as in you agree to bring certain resources into a common pool that becomes the subject of policy formulation, or you agree to share responsibilities to say that we are going to do A, B, C, D. You bring X amount, you bring X amount, you bring X amount. And then you have your national constituencies, including the national parliament, representative uh, accountability. That says that this is how we are supposed to hold our governments accountable for what we have decided to deliver at the, at the regional level. At the moment, unless there's a major crisis you know, on the borders, National Parliament does not hold South African government responsible for implementation of regional industrial policy because it just doesn't make, it doesn't buy votes. There's nobody out there who is going to go out there and stick his political head and put it on the line to say that uh, let us build an eight led road to Zimbabwe so that more Zimbabwean support in South Africa. And if there is no accountability at that level, or let us create a fast speed train from here to Maputo or to Harare or to Square for the sake of the argument. So it, it's a resource allocation problem. It is the model of regionalism problem. And so we are going to keep talking about these issues of, of regional industrial policy and sub-regional industrial policy up and on to such a time when we deal with the fundamentals, we deal with the basics, we deal with the whole notion of I'm South African, but I'm, I'm African. Uh, and that practically means that if I have a loaf of bread, I'm going to share with the person in Zimbabwe. But conditionally, I'm going to tell the person in Zimbabwe that, hey, this loaf of bread is not sufficient for me. I'm willing to share with you on condition that you do A, B, C. But Zimbabwe is not going to take that because they're always going to say, no, you're not going to come and tell me what I'm going to do in my country. And then South Africa is expected to now share its resources with Zimbabwe. And then Zimbabwe in the meantime does not want to carry out the kinds of reforms and establish the kinds of institutions that make sure that the management of the scarce resources that South Africa and Zimbabwe and everybody in South has pooled does not end up in a bank account in Dubai or in, uh, in Switzerland. So we have that kind of shared responsibility in terms of our model of journalism. That is why if you look at the cooperation model of the European Union, countries, even in the context of the current COVID-19, you know, the conservative three essentially told, it's usually a north-south thing, you know, the Spain and your Greece and your Italy of the world go up to your Germany and your France and your Netherlands. And they say, yes, we know that you are going through COVID-19 and you are suffering, but we're not giving you free money. There is no free lunch. For us to give you this money, you have to carry out substantive reform. Even admission into the European Union is conditional, conditional upon the set of certain, uh, upon the certain uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, management style, conditional upon the adoption of certain values of liberal democracy. 
it is not association by geographical proximity. It is association by shared values. And until we get African regionalism to the point where we actually are redefining what it means to be African and to cooperate together, industrial policy and all these conversations about industrialization at the country at the level of continent, it's going to be a pipe dream. We're going to keep talking about it at least over and over and over and over again. We need to fundamentally change our model of cooperation. It's, it's, it's the argument I would make about that briefly. Thank you, Gabila. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, yeah, I think, Gabila, there's one other one. Maybe you can take it off. Uh, Kinga was asking a very deep question around whether the structural I'm issue is on you. that. Please, if you have any direct questions to the presenters, they're available on the chat function. You can send them private messages as well. Uh, their email addresses are available. I didn't get the, the question from Kinga. Um, I think he will chat, he will inbox you directly um, to get your response. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, only one who can clap for you here, uh, but I think uh, consider everybody else clapping digitally as well. Uh, thanks, colleagues. Um, we have about 10 minutes until the next session where we'll be discussing sector specific uh, examples of regional value chains. So please stay online, uh, grab a cup of coffee, some snacks or something, and then we'll be back in about 10 minutes. Thank you.